All right, folks, we're going to be looking at uh, the lecture materials for Unit 3, which is uh, focused on Chapter 3 from our text. Um, I do have the uh, PowerPoint attached here to the topics for the chapters if you want to pull it down and follow along. Uh, this will mimic the content in the book. I'm not going through every single slide. As I normally say, I kind of like highlight certain ones and important concepts. Um, and oh my God, if I talked over every single one, we'd be here forever because there's 53 slides in this slideshow. That's a lot for one chapter. Um, but there are some really uh, good and important materials in here that we, we should focus in on. Um, one of the, you know, the, the, the main topics here is how things fit into organizations uh, and information systems and how things are used for strategic advantage. And there's a number of really cool case studies and I hope you guys take uh, the time to read some of those because there's nothing like real world examples to kind of point out uh, interesting things about IT and, and organizational structure really in many cases. Uh, the one thing that uh, we start with here is kind of thinking how when you have an organization of a particular size, so let's say like a mid-sized company and above, um, you know, where maybe you have several hundred employees, for example, and you have a department that runs the technology, that there's this kind of this symbiotic thing that happens between the technology department and the other aspects of the organization. In many cases, one can help to steer the other and usually they kind of steer each other symbiotically especially if you're relying on the information technology to drive any of the major business processes and um, you know if you can think of like maybe just even the things we do here at gateway for example uh, the type of information systems we have on hand and, and if you just consider blackboard and how that operates um, and how you know the mechanics of that are relative to what i teach but they're also impacting you as a student or so ultimately the end user is affected directly by this product and how we use it and it also helps to drive the organization in other ways for example in the grading system you know the grading system in there helps us to determine your grades in there and put them onto your permanent record just for example um they go through a couple of different slides here you know kind of like highlighting the same thing we just talked about um, but they also kind of break it down and start talking about what formally is an organization and without becoming like a course in straight up like business, you know, uh, concepts, you know, there's there's what we call a technical definition and a behavioral one. And I think they're, they're kind of interesting to think about. The technical one says a formal social structure that processes resources from the environment to produce outputs. And I want you to notice how that fits into a system structure also. Isn't that kind of an interesting correlation? Um, and also a formal legal entity that might have its own internal rules and processes uh, and social structure. And you know what? I think that in many ways, like the organization I work for fits both of those categories, I think. Maybe more so the second one, um, but we process resources too from the environment, which is knowledge and we produce output, which is hopefully educated students. So I think about it like that, you know, so I, that's why I think Gateway would fit maybe both of these. There's also a behavioral aspect to an organization, and this is kind of an interesting definition. It's a collection of rights, privileges, obligations, and responsibilities that are balanced over a period of time through conflict and, and conflict resolution. So this is more relative to the entity on a kind of a different level right and both are valid so you might have organizations that focus on one aspect or the other aspect but really all organizations have both of these aspects kind of rolled up into them somehow various shades but somehow kind of going into that like systems approach thing again so you see the inputs and the outputs and i think it's fascinating how this transcends a lot of the concepts in this area um they also show some of the you know things that happen when you're looking at it from a behavioral way versus a, a technical way but you still have inputs and outputs it's just what are you processing in between are more kind of you know touchy feeling things as opposed to data and processes and manufacturing but it's still uh important aspects a lot of organizations have some sort of a hierarchy um and I'm sure wherever you guys work has that, you know, 
whether it's a really huge company or a small one, there's usually somebody who's in charge or overseeing other people or running uh, different functional areas. And, you know, organizations have this tendency as they operate over time to get into certain things that they do organizationally to make things happen, you know, whatever their business or um, thing is that they're doing. Um, when you look at, you know, what they're talking about here, like sometimes you just form routines of like how you do stuff because, hey, it just works that way. And then that becomes the process without maybe never even formalizing it. You know, why do you, you know, put the groceries in the paper bag? Because, well, I guess that's just kind of what we do because people want to take it home. Um, is, you know, just for example, if you look at, um, you know, more formalized things, some people will actually start to break down processes uh, and collect them and formalize them, define them even, uh, create manuals for them uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, organizations, you know, because there's people involved are, are often um, fraught with politics, depending on what type of organization it is. Often a business organization might have some of these aspects, but, you know, being driven largely by profit in the bottom line, that's usually like, like the deciding factor in many cases. Um, you know, other uh, things to consider about uh, political issues within organizations is how they can impact or, uh, up, you know, basically resist potential change. And one of the biggest areas of change in any organization in the modern era is through, because of technology, typically, the, the impact on business processes and systems and information flow. Um, you know, change is often kind of like one of the big um, things that that will be sometimes completely halted by some of those factors, by the way. And, and, and often the culture of the organization can do the same thing. Um, when you look at an organization from a cultural perspective, and, and I don't know if you've ever even thought about this, about where you work, but organizations definitely have some sort of a culture. And having worked in a few of them, I've seen it as I've gone from institution to institution and kind of the feel of the people that work at a place even. And, you know, what's the attitude of management towards the workers and the workers towards the management and towards their clients and the clients towards, you know, all, you know, all of it. Um, and not all organizations are healthy that way. There's organizations that have problems uh, in many ways. Um, I, would, I would always tell you if they, you guys are out looking for work, that's one thing you should look at you know, is what kind of organization you're looking at working for and do a little research on them. Sometimes you can find some interesting things. Uh, organizations, you know, are kind of subjected to the environment um, in, in which they operate. And there's some kind of like strange um, fundamental truths to this, unfortunately, because sometimes the environment can influence the organization. Uh, and often the organizations can influence their environments. And, you know, and I think the one that I, I work for has that kind of uh, reciprocal thing going on because our employers in our area influence what we teach and the students that we produce influence our employers with, you know, making them productive, for example, or useful to the, that organization. Um, the strange thing is, is a lot of times, um, you know, Sometimes, and I think this is a very interesting uh, statement, environments generally change faster than organizations. And so the outside world might be switching over to some different system. And here's your organization, you know, lagging like 10, 20 years behind. And then, you know, why, right? You know, why, why, does, why don't we adopt that? But sometimes organizations stay a certain way for a reason. And, and sometimes that reason is very simple. It, whatever they're doing is already working. And so it's, it's difficult to move away from something that works correctly just to hypothetically save money by switching to something else. Um, and so a lot of times, you know, they use this analogy of the, of the lens, how you kind of see the outside world and you kind of bring all these aspects into what you do within the company. A uh, really good example is like, what, what did your place of employment do when the pandemic kicked in? Did they let people work from home? Did you have to come to work and wear a mask and a suit and a mat, you know, a shield and, you know, and spray yourself down with this disinfectant every time, like you leave your desk or something, you know, who, who knows, right. And, and um, 
what did most firms do is they look to the outside world. What's the outside world doing? What should we do? And and in, in, in some cases, they're looking at, you know, what is the government telling them to do? And is the government really telling anybody to do anything? That's a whole separate issue. Like the CDC has guidelines, for example, um, not necessarily rules. Um, this is kind of uh, back to that topic that I was talking about before. Um, disruptive technologies, you heard me like throwing that, that term around. And, you know, sometimes you have certain technologies that come into the mix that really kind of change how you do things. And you can think of uh, some of the examples that they have here, how personal computers coming into the workplace made a big change. You know, how do people type a letter before they had, you know, computers in their desk while they used typewriters, right? And they had, you know, uh, secretaries or steno pools that would do the work for them. Um, and those are whole career paths. And now you can just pick up your phone, talk to it, and it can type a letter for you. Uh, pretty much. Does Alexa do that for you, Nick, if you asked? Uh, it depends on exactly what you're asking. Sometimes she's super particular. Alexa, can you please type my term paper? I'm sorry, Nick, I can't comply. That would be akin to cheating. Something like that, Nick? I mean, she does take notes down, but nothing that, like, super specific. Okay. I think that, it, that you know, uh, we're at the era where you can do that, though. You know that... Um, all the office products and even all the Google office products have built in dictation tools. If you guys haven't tried them, you should give them a try. They're, they actually work pretty well as long as you have a good, good audio connection. <clears throat> but they're talking about um, here. And, and this is, I was looking for this in the article and, and then it dawned on me. Oh, it was here. Um, you know, the concept of first movers or fast followers, you know, when it comes to disruptive technologies and there's the people that usually invent, the, the disruptive technologies, and then others will follow trying to capitalize on it. So like with smartphones, right? So like Apple kind of kind of did it first, even though it wasn't completely a unique idea. And then Samsung was kind of doing it at the same time, and it kind of devolved into this whole thing. Um, but that happens, right? So like whatever technology is coming out um, that changes the whole marketplace, others will try to follow. Uh, you know, can you think of anything aside from what's on this list as a disruptive technology. You said mobile phones before, right? I was just thinking about, um, you know, like how music became digitized, you know, so the, that was interesting because I mean, like you think of the smartphone, and you associate that, at least I do, with Apple. So, but like music becoming like MP3s and things like that, it just changed the way music is marketed and, and sold. And it, it seems to me like it didn't belong to a certain company. Like I think of Napster, but Napster is not around anymore. I don't know what became of it, but it's not like one company came up with that and then dominated the market. It's like they, they couldn't figure out a way to sell it. You know what I mean? Right. And, and but eventually, like what happened is that Apple released the iPod. Right. And then everybody, well, and everybody kind of made all those devices at the same time. We think that the iPod was the only one and that's not the case. Right. There were lots of lots of MP3 players out there. Um, but the iPod was like, you know, the easiest, most user friendliest, whatever device. Right. And and so our music music became digitized. And once it's digitized and you're connecting it to iTunes or whatever service you're using, then all of a sudden this stuff is out in the cloud somewhere and linking together. And then ultimately, I mean, how do you guys consume your music now? Is it Apple Music? Is it Spotify? Is it Pandora? Is it YouTube? Is it, you know, and the answer is probably yes to all of those, right? Or most of those or some of those. Um, yeah, and is that a disruptive technology? Well, I'll tell you what, it's a disruptive one to the people who make money off the music because I know the music musicians don't make the money anymore. Exactly, right. I mean, it totally changed the way record companies work, you know, and and obviously musicians too. Right, and, you know, 
see, I'm kind of hoping that this has kind of a backlash effect, though, Dennis, because, um, you know, so what, what did people do who couldn't sell records to make money anymore? They go on the road and they sell concert tickets instead, right, and, and merchandise. And they charge a hefty price, you know, and they put on a show. And now that's shut down, too. So it's like a whole industry is kind of eliminated in a sense. Yep. Um, I would like to see it where the streaming services maybe charge a little more or give a little bit more to the artists. I think that would that would be a generally good thing. That's why we're seeing so many upticks in like DMCA strikes and stuff, though. It's because of all that. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, and, and I think that trend will continue for a while, you know. If you know, if I was to make a judgment call on it, um, all right, let's keep uh, moving through this. Um, so, some of the basic organizational structures, and you'll see, like, depending on what industry you're in, this is often uh, going to be dictated by that. Um, you know, the, so the type of structure is really dictated by what you do. Uh, I know that we have a very, you know, I guess I would put us into probably this category at Gateway, one of these two, you know, I, I think a little bit of both. Um, it's certainly not any of the others at Gateway, but you think about what we do, right? So we hire professionals to teach people to become professionals is kind of the mindset. Um, and think about what you guys might do. Like if you worked at like a sales company and what are you selling? Well, that might be completely entrepreneurial or maybe you're building something from scratch or whatever. So every organization will have different uh, structures um, as a result you know that you're going to have all sorts of different ways to run all sorts of different goals and missions uh, you're going to have for profits nonprofits, whatever um, and they can have very very different operating agendas as a result and um, that's one thing i think a lot of people don't think about as they go into the workplace like great you landed that big corporate job but do you like what they do you know, that, that type of thing. Or, um, you know, or if you work for a nonprofit like I do, do you like what they do? You know, or who they're affiliated with? Well, I happen to, to like what I do because I think it's a positive. You know, it's a positive for society and the community. And so I feel good about what I do professionally. Um, I didn't always feel that way when I was working for commercial companies. Like I've taught, for example, for University of Phoenix where their mission is profit. Plain and simple because they're a public excuse me, a private institution. They are not uh, one that is necessarily religiously affiliated. They're a for-profit institution and their product is education. Right? So I, don't, I, I didn't feel as comfortable with that one, but these are things you have to think about. The way the organizations are run as a result is a lot different too. Um, whatever happens with whatever organization you're in, IT can significantly impact the economics of organizations, uh, both positively and negatively. The thought is that it should be positive, you know, hey, you're, you're adding some efficiency or something. But the reality is sometimes to get to that efficiency, it costs a lot of money. And then what is, you know, the, the economic cost, but also what's the human cost that goes in there. Um, one little example they have here, and I thought this was a nice little example. Information technology helps firms contract in size because it can reduce transaction costs. So this is talking about um, if the company does any sort of business where you are ordering product or selling product or um, doing a purchase order for supplies or whatever that is. There's so many people within an organization that are just hired to do those activities. And if you can put technology in place that eliminates the need for those positions, you're going to save the company a whole bunch of money. But you're also putting a whole bunch of people out of work you know, at the same time. But the company will be stronger because it made more profit and will last into the future. Maybe those people can be retrained and become IT people, you know. Um, so who knows? But that's that's kind of one of those the classic uh, things. Um, if you start looking into like the theory that goes behind it, so they break it down into a couple different categories here. And the transaction cost theory is a big one. And this is one of the things that costs companies lots of money is the functional process of whatever the employees are doing. So if you can think of like, for example, at Gateway, if you guys go into student services and sign up for a class and maybe you walk up to the 
counter to do this. Maybe you do this online, which is better, but that's kind of putting somebody out of work too. But if you go in person, that person exists to help you make the right choices, make sure you paid the right way, make sure that you know what your situation is. They give you the paperwork in your hand. They smile at you and, and but there's a cost, right? They, you have to pay for their, their wages, their insurance, um, all that stuff. And um, is it better to register online? Well, some people say yes, some people will say no. Like, what if I have a question in the middle of it and I don't know what to do, right? And so that is a, a cost that's huge to, for businesses to remove often, but there's reasons why they cannot be removed completely at the same time. And that's, that's something to think about. So not everything can efficiently be moved to like an online or, a, or an information system that is automatic where you just interact with the screen. Not everything works that way. There's also other organizations that operate more in what we call like the agency approach. So in other words, let's say you worked, um, I don't know, uh, you know, they, they say here a nexus of contracts among self-interested parties. And maybe this might be an advertising agency or something like that it might be the, the type of example. But you have a bunch of people performing really kind of incongruent tasks that are really built more on contracts as opposed to uh, like a manufacturing process, for example. Um, and in those situations, you can reduce uh, some of the costs, it says here, by basically automating processes that would otherwise be handled by people that would need to supervise all of it. And so you might automate a process, for example, of like signing a contract or approving a contract. Uh, and maybe you have a piece of software that can just analyze the terms of the contract and automatically say, yep, it checks all the boxes, this one's good to go. And now I don't have to hire this guy at $100,000 a year to sit there and make the same decision with a rubber stamp. You know, with the software can do it probably better than he can and we're saving all this money. And so that's seen as one of those huge cost savings too but this time you see that the the impact is typically more on the managing or the oversight component as opposed to the functional process aspect of it and i think that's uh, an important thing to note um you know the, the general thought here is as um you know you put more information systems in place and make them more efficient large organizations tend to flatten in other words we start uh, finding ways to replace people in kind of like middle management type of roles um, or maybe like director roles or things like that, supervisor roles, uh, and be able to flatten things um, and where there's less of a distinction between the people doing the functional tasks and the people running the place. Um, and then fewer people can really kind of steer the ship. Um, and I think that I thought this was a really kind of interesting quote here too, and I'm glad I remembered to go back to it. It says here that in post-industrial organizations, you know, authority increasingly relies on knowledge and competence rather than formal positions. So in other words, what does it matter if you have like somebody on this level that really knows their stuff and this guy's just doing the, the regular old tasks, whereas if you have somebody down here that really knows their stuff and is doing the tasks, and there's more value in that to modern corporations to have that. And I think that's a pretty important thing. So knowledge and competence become more important um, necessarily than having levels of supervision. And that hypothetically is enabled by information systems. Um, all right, so we're skipping past this stuff here. Kind of going back to this, this concept here, you know, talking about resistance to change, because a lot of what we study in information systems is finding you know weaknesses in current information system processes and finding ways to improve them you know what, what the classic being perhaps moving from a paper to a technology system uh, for information and you know when you start to think about the fact that people might not want to follow that you know, I don't know if you guys have ever been in a situation at work where it's like, oh, guess what? We have a new piece of software now. And yeah, you have to learn how to use it. Yeah, like today. Have you ever been in that situation where all of a sudden something's changed? Um, and that happens quite a bit. And then what will also happen is the people using the systems will get so comfortable that they don't want to even try to adjust to the new system. Seeing, 
you know, what way the old system was better and more efficient, you know, and maybe they're right. Maybe it was in some ways, you know, not, not always is, you know, an updated piece of software, a good thing. You know, we're, you know, typically we'd like to think so, but not always. Some of that, it really will be affected by how the or organization operates um, and how they, they roll things out. So some organizations will just jump right to the change without soliciting feedback or, or piloting it or trying it. And some will be very cautious. And which is better? Well, it depends on how agile you want your company to be and how technology disruptive are you, are you like in tight competition? You know, and that's a big thing. Sometimes you have to change quickly because the competitors have and you have to keep up. And then if you don't keep up, you're out of business. And some market segments are like that. They're very, very competitive. Um, and some aren't. And so that, that helps to dictate it too. Um, you know, the internet and its impact on organizations has been pretty uh, monstrous as well. Um, you can't really... Um, argue that in any way, shape or form. So many companies have moved things to cloud-based operations. Um, Dennis, what you, I, I heard you guys say that you guys use Outlook for email. Do you actually use Outlook in the browser or do you use Outlook installed? Installed. Installed, interesting. Yeah. And is that company-wide? Everybody does it that way? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Okay. Now. I wouldn't be surprised if at some point they say at your company, and maybe they won't. <clears throat> okay, everybody, we're now doing email through our browser. You don't need Outlook anymore. Mm -hmm. And I would predict at some point in the future they're going to do that to you, because a lot of a lot of like Microsoft email, you know, based organizations uh, have made that move recently. Uh, Gateway made that move uh, well over a decade ago, and that's because their Microsoft system went down horribly, <laughs> and they were like. All right, we're just, you know, we're moving on to, let's try Google. All right, sounds good. Uh, and when I came in, you know, that was actually a selling point for me to work here because I already knew the system really well, you know, and a lot of like internal people didn't. Um, but that's a different way to work because if you have like installed email applications that connect to a email server that's on site and then all of a sudden you're connecting to some cloud service that some other organization really kind of controls, um, that has an impact. But I know for Gateway, they were able to um, reassign people that were running the email. They had like two people running their email systems, full-time workers, right? And they were able to reassign those people to other tasks because after they switched to Google, they really didn't need them to do that full-time. And, and so that that's a thing that happens too. Um, there's a, a couple other areas here I want to talk about. I do want to talk about this concept because this is, you know, in terms of uh, the business world and, and Arnie, I know that you've got your MBA, right? Um, you probably have studied right. this, this model at some point. Have you? Um, oh yeah. Yeah. This is, sure. this is a pretty famous business concept basically, but just, I don't really want to spend too much time on it. I, I think the book does a nice job of covering it pretty briefly. And, and so read that check section of the chapter carefully, if you could. Um, but it says here, why do some firms become leaders in their industry? And then what they do is they have this kind of theory that has, uh, you know, these five precepts, basically, that it looks at what they call the competitive forces that shape your industry. And they look at you know, your competitors, uh, who's entering into the market, the products and services that people could use other than yours, uh, your customers and your suppliers and how, you know, all the things that affect all these segments affect really kind of the overall approach to how you operate uh, your organization. And so they, they kind of break those down in the next couple of slides. And I think most of them are pretty self-explanatory. So you can just kind of read them here really quick. Um, but if you look at uh, some of these, so like traditional com competitors, you know, so most businesses operate with competition. That's kind of the, the precept of free market, um, but some more so than others. And that that's a big one. Um, people can also, um, you know, substitute products and services, you know, so 
people can always look to other stuff. And this kind of goes back to competition too, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes people just change what they do uh, because of uh, competitive forces. And I think like one, one really interesting one to think about perhaps is like we were talking about how Spectrum is now switched from being like a cable TV company to really being an internet provider more than anything else because who really pays for cable TV anymore? Well, some people do, but most people stream, it seems. So most people have canceled that cable TV service. So of course, you know, are you substituting? I mean, did you get rid of cable TV really? Or are you just finding different ways to watch stuff you want to watch? And so, you know, that, that's, that's an example. Um, that sometimes it's not your competition. It's not like Charter, you know, came into town and AT&T and Dish Network and took away all of Spectrum's TV customers. They, they left those services too, you know, and they're all, they're all just getting internet access with streaming services. You know, often you see these uh, graphics represented with this model too. Um, and I think, you know, if you want to look at it in a visual way, go for it. Now, the thing about IT is this is where it comes into play in, in, in terms of when we start talking about the strategic aspects of IT. The beautiful thing about IT is sometimes you can take, a, frankly, a really small company and depending on how you portray its IT infrastructure, often sometimes just the website, can make a company look much bigger than they are or more, more fairly said, allow them to compete on the same playing field with any other company, right? So th that's kind of the beauty of the internet and the scary part of the internet. If you're opening up, let's say, a little tiny store on Main Street in your hometown, you and let's say you sell coffee, well, there's a coffee, you got a coffee shop and there's a guy at the other end that's got a coffee shop too. That's your competitive force. <laughs> you know, he's the other coffee shop up the street and the McDonald's down the road. But when you do it on the internet, now you're opening up to everybody. But at the same time, small players, if positioned correctly with their technology, can compete head to head with big players and very quickly uh, grow and overcome them in some cases. And I think that's one of the astounding things about that aspect of it. Um, and you start looking at um, how people are utilizing the technology too. So like putting up a website is one thing but using it to allow you to operate more efficiently, um, maybe with less, less mistakes. And remember we were talking about, and this was in the other class, I think you guys, we were talking about RFID chips and how Walmart has put them on all their pallets. So whenever they take a, a pallet of product off the truck uh, that comes into a store, the moment it crosses through the threshold, they have a chip reader that reads the inventory directly into their database and you know, so the moment the, the PlayStation 5 crosses that doorway, it's in the inventory system and some employee is trying to steal it. I mean, sell it. Um, <laughs> you know, that's kind of what happens with the game systems I hear at Walmart. Um, but there's an efficiency there because now you're taking the aspect where somebody's got to take the plastic off, count every box, check it on an invoice, type it into a system, and then it goes into inventory and then they can sell it. And how much time does that take and how efficient is that? And is that better person better off being reallocated to perform some other function, maybe helping a customer or, uh, you know, picking up some carts in the parking lot? I don't know. Whatever the task is, could it could it be more efficiently used? Um, all right. Other thing that's kind of cool, too, is uh, this. I, I always thought that this was kind of a neat aspect, too. Um, some there are companies out there you know where they do have like a niche in the marketplace and what they're trying to uh, point out here is sometimes when you have a market niche technology gives you a different kind of advantage because you're not really necessarily going up against uh, a competitor but you're potentially opening yourself up really to a, a new uh, marketplace altogether that might not have existed for you in the past um, the other one that they have at the bottom of this slide here which is where suppliers and manufacturers often are connected together through their supply chain. So very simple uh, systems such as, you know, inventory systems that auto order the product so that you don't run out during manufacturing, you know, and removing those barriers and then connecting information systems from a supplier 
to a manufacturer and having those interconnected. So not they're not the same company, but the information flow is free because if they're always ordering from the same supplier, then why not automate that process and make it work as efficiently as possible? You know, put the human resources on other tasks, more more pertinent and valuable uh, tasks. Um, we talk about the internet again, of course, huge, absolutely huge um, impact um, because a lot of the information systems that in the past were difficult to link together are now super easy. And the fact that many of uh, large organizations use the same technology platforms to run their applications, you know, so for example, some people will buy into the Microsoft products, the Azure cloud, and some will buy into the Google cloud, and some will buy into the Amazon cloud. Um, and when they're running together on those platforms, um, the information flow is quite uh, simplistic in some cases. This is uh, that one little thing that we talked about, the Internet of Things, and this is a huge growth area as well. Um, now, IoT as a general thing refers to this like, special class of tiny devices, and I have one here on my desk. And you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and disconnect it because it's too hard to do otherwise. But this, folks, if you can see this, I'm trying to, <laughs> right here is a, what we call a Raspberry Pi. I do have it in a plastic case, but it's a credit card sized computer. It's a little, well, a little bit bigger than a credit card. Uh, it's got a bunch of USB ports and a network port and a power port and an HDMI and a headphone jack and some special connectors and a spot for an SD card, which allows it to be a full blown computer system that cost me at least this portion of it, about $35 all told. Right. Add a power supply and a couple of other doodads in a case and maybe 50, 60 bucks. Um, and it's a full-blown computer system that's also capable of running um, like a traditional desktop or a laptop, those types of applications, browsers, office suites, etc. Even run Windows 10 on them, by the way. Or you can turn them into proprietary devices, usually running on top of a Linux operating system to do very specialized things. For example, turning them into a game console or a media streaming device, or a security application, or a makeshift customized tablet, or just a device that reads data from something and then stores it in a database. Or you can make it a web server, or you can make it a coding platform, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You do so much with them. And because basically what we have is the capability of a full computer in the palm of our hand, this technology now is very easy to add to all sorts of equipment that we, we never thought we could set up before. So for example, if I was running an industrial robot that I could program to build parts, I could attach this device to it, or this could be part of it. And then that would take all the information that's generated by the robot in real time and feed it through our network directly into our database servers where we could analyze the data, watch the robot perform, see if it's performing up to spec, or if we see a problem with it and maybe stop it from failing before it actually reaches the failure point and fix it before it completely breaks, that type of thing. Um, and then you can do other things where this type of technology is also the kind of things that drives a lot of our smart cars, you know, just very simple little computer chips or our ring doorbells. You know, people often turn these into surveillance systems. You know, you attach a couple of cameras, uh, you can make it a, a hard drive recorder really easily. And that whole facet of devices um, is exploding. And, and I bring the ring doorbells into it because I think that's a really interesting device in itself, right? Because you walk down the street now and how many of your neighbors have those? So every time you're walking by, you know, camera flips on because it detected you and they know in your house that you're walking through. And more importantly, that streams back to some service that who knows who else can tap into that, you know? Um, and you can like think nefarious on it, I suppose, but I, at the same time, um, you know, the information that we're generating is huge. So we can take all the information these devices are generating. This is just one, right? And then you think of everybody's devices. And as we start to add like smart thermostats and smart sensors and cameras and put stuff in our cars and whatever, this is where all the data is coming from. What are we doing with all this data? Oh my God. I mean, we're going to think of like things to do with them. One of, one of the, I think, potential 
explosive areas for economic gain in the near future is to figure out what to do with all the data these things are making. Like in, just looking looking at the information in a new way could be the next you know gold mine. You know what information are we generating that we're just not looking at? Maybe maybe that's the key. If you're looking for like a, a thing to kind of break out of your current job or something, um, they talk about this uh, this uh, business value chain model here a little bit, um, and this is kind of one of those classic business things too. Uh, Arnie, I'm probably sure you've seen uh, you know charts like this too, but they talk about. Um, you know, what we call like the primary activities of the business versus the support activities of the business, but how they do have to work together in order to uh, accomplish the goal. And so most businesses have some operational aspect to them. Um, and technology is typically not the operational aspect, but the thing that helps the operational aspect reach efficiency. Uh, in some cases, you work for organizations where the technology, so you have like coders, for example, the technology is the product. And that's kind of puts it in a, a whole different category because wait, does a technology company also have an IT department? You know, that's like the question that you're asking. The answer to that is yes. <laughs> so they have their own IT department to deal with even though they might cre be creating technology products themselves. So I think that's really kind of a fascinating uh, circular loop there. Um, you know, they, they, they extend this concept out to the web, by the way, the, the, you know, the value chain, the value web. Um, and kind of illustrate it in this thing. But really what they're trying to point out here is more how there's an interaction between all these things, uh, even where you don't think there is one. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to move on down here. All right. Now we're going to talk a little bit just very quickly about these network-based uh, strategies. So um, when companies do start to link together, um, there's some you know, ability for them to find some new efficiencies because of the link, really kind of forming, uh, in some cases, entirely new economic systems that exist kind of independent of others. Uh, a really big growth area for this, for example, is in the business to business markets. Uh, we're not even thinking business to consumer here because so many companies traditionally had very primitive, um, you know, let's say supply procurement systems in place where it was like as simple as like a phone call or, uh, you know, contact your salesperson to take your order, you know, things um, to where if you can automate these processes, once again, um, it really can grow the economy, uh, basically, because you're, you're creating an efficiency. All right. Uh, I think there was one more I wanted to talk about here which is the very last uh, slide. Um, we kind of work our way up through all these concepts into what we call strategic information systems where we're starting to use the IT to give us an advantage in whatever you know area that we're trying to perform in. You know? So whether you're, you're manufacturing something or you're selling something or providing a service, um, you know, this is where it kind of all ties together. There's significant, um, you know, differences between companies that leverage these types of techniques and use the technology uh, to gain strategic advantage uh, when you compare them to companies that don't. And, and you'll notice quickly the ones that have kind of like a soft approach to some of the technologies will fade away pretty quickly. Um, there's no mistaking why companies like Apple and Microsoft and HP and Facebook, and you can name a bunch of those, um, why they seem to be able to not only get something going, but then sustain it somehow. Because in principle, like we talked about Facebook and think about, you know, they came out with really kind of a simplistic product um, and have leveraged that into like this empire. Um, that's pretty astounding. How did they manage to do that where so many other social networks uh, faltered. They didn't know how to monetize it at all. They figured out how to monetize it and how to leverage it into a whole bunch of different products, um, all of which are seemingly making money. And, you know, not just the illegally selling your data to other companies part, but the, you know, the actual, like the advertising pieces of it, which is where a lot of the revenue comes from. So 
um, how how do, how you approach the problem really kind of becomes a, a thing, and how you embrace you know the forward movement of the technology. I think does too. So it's particularly for companies that um, are are focused on being technological. If you're not like embracing some of the principles of being kind of like forward thinking and in some cases aggressive about the implementation of technology, you're really going to suffer in the future, it seems, is kind of the paradigm of the new operating business world. All right, unless you guys have any questions, I'm going to stop the video here.